Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the March edition of the W. Brent Bergen Lunch and Learn Lecture Series. I see Brent is online with us today. Uh, good to see you, Brent. Um, before we get started in introducing today's lecture, I'd like to mention that our upcoming lecture is on April the 16th. Uh, for the Lunch and Learn uh, for April, we will have uh, Dr. Faye Jensen. She's the CEO of the South Carolina Historical Society. Uh, she'll be giving a lecture called Madeira to Moonshine, a drinking history of South Carolina. Now everybody, we only have 300 slots available, so please sign up early because I know that one will be popular. Today, I delight in an opportunity to introduce uh, a, a new faculty colleague to uh, our Native American Studies Center patrons, uh, to uh, uh, folks that come from near and far for lunch and learn, and of course to the Lancaster community. Uh, uh, Dean Todd Lekin arrived in the midst of the pandemic. The first time I met him, I said, hey, it's like you're the new fire captain and you arrive at the fire station and the building's on fire. Uh, and so a lot of you have not gotten an opportunity to meet Dean Lekin, and so this is a great opportunity to do that. Uh, he is Associate Dean of Academic Affairs and Student Affairs here at USC Lancaster. Uh, that means he's second in command and uh, is in charge of all faculty and all student affairs. Um, he is a professor of philosophy. Uh, he received his uh, bachelor's and master's degree at the Ohio State University, and then a PhD from the University of Illinois uh, Urbana-Champaign. Uh, his research is in the history of American philosophy and in ethics, and uh, uh, today we'll, we'll be getting a taste of that. Uh, today's lecture is Just Like an Animal, a philosophical examination of our ethical assumptions about cognitive disabilities and the value of animals. Uh, so with that said, uh, I give you Todd Lekin. Take it away, Dean. Hey, thanks so much, Professor Judge. Um, I, I, I do want to thank Professor Judge and the whole um, NASC staff, Ashley, Katie, um, for this important series, Brent. Um, it's an honor to be part of the series. Uh, you know, I'm just getting to know this community, but I've sat in on a number of these um, presentations, and this is doing the great work of our university, enriching the cultural, social, intellectual, aesthetic life of our region. Um, it's it's just a great part of USCL, and I'm I'm really proud to be part of this venue today. So greetings to you all. Um, I'm coming to you with my philosopher's hat on today, not my dean hat. Um, for next generation fans, I am like number one, which means I'm number two on the campus. Um, and it's it's been quite a quite a ride um, in the pandemic, but yeah, I'm here as a philosopher. So I'm, I'm gonna talk to you today about um, some ethical issues at the intersection of cognitive disabilities and our obligations to non-human animals. And I'm gonna try to share my screen, which I think I'm authorized to do right now. And let's do that. So, uh, I hope you're all seeing, seeing that. That moment where you're not sure you're coming through. Okay, so um, yeah, I, as, as Professor Judge mentioned, uh, my work is in ethics and the tradition of American philosophy. And um, for many years, I taught an environmental ethics class with a, often with a colleague who worked in conservation science. It was a sort of interdisciplinary class. And um, that in, in the course of that class, you know, I got deeply immersed in issues with animals and the environment. And lately I've been um, thinking about ethical issues around cognitive disabilities. And what I wanna to talk to you today about is some of the tensions that have arisen between two kinds of advocates, advocates for animal, um, for, for animal ethics and advocates for the cognitively disabled. And I'm going to structure my talk in three parts. So in part one, I, I wanna explore very briefly some assumptions about the lesser status of non-human animals and um, how deeply embedded that um, assumption is, especially in the Western philosophical tradition, right? And in the course of doing so, I, I wanna talk about some ways in which we tend to compare humans to non-human animals for various moral and immoral purposes. So there's a familiar tactic where dehumanization of a, of a group often takes the, 
the tactic of comparison to non-human animals. But recently, um, there has been um, an attempt to compare cognitively disabled humans to non-human animals for the purpose, for a moral purpose, for the purpose of helping us to see our obligations to to non-human animals. Okay, so I'll, I'll cover that in part one, and then in the second part of the presentation, I want to look at the evaluate. I want to evaluate the response to that kind of comparison from disabilities advocates, many of whom are troubled by. Um, the attempt of animal ethics advocates to compare uh, animals and people with cognitive disabilities. And then finally, in the third part of my talk, I wanna do a little bit of mediation, all right? And so I'm just going to gesture towards some ways in which we might think about mediating this dispute. And I really wanna structure this talk as kind of staging a dialogue or a debate, opening up our minds to thinking about assumptions we maybe don't always think about and maybe in our discussion after the presentation, we'll, we'll kick around some ideas. So I'm not gonna you know, offer something like the, you know, the right theory of thinking about these things, but offer some tentative suggestions. A word about my method in this, um, just very briefly, I come at these issues as a pragmatist moral philosopher, and I'm not gonna get into too much of what that means, but I am starting from a position of saying that moral philosophy ought to take for granted what I would call a condition of limited sympathy and altruism. So if you look at the tradition of philosophy in the West, there's often um, an attempt to address what you might call like an egoist skeptic. So a lot of Western philosophy, going back to Plato, thinks of the job of moral philosophy as offering some rational convincing argument to convince basically somebody who uh, doesn't believe they have any obligations to anyone else that they should care about others. And I reject that starting point. And here I, I just follow um, a, a wonderful paper written by a philosopher named Richard Rorty, who basically, in, in my mind, does a good job in saying that philosophy gets off on the wrong foot when it thinks of its job as convincing such an egoist skeptic. Rather, we should think of moral philosophy's goal as an ongoing effort to create an, what, what I'll call an inclusive ethical republic. And that's a phrase I borrow from William James, a, a pragmatist moral philosophy philosopher in the uh, American tradition. And that, that goal is mediating diverse perspectives, um, starting from the assumption that all of us have some kind of, you know, to varying degrees, limited sympathy or limited altruism, usually for like-minded others, and our goal is to constantly you know, challenge those per perspectives in an ever, um, ever ongoing approach to create what James called the ethical republic. So that's just you know, some background assumptions. A few other things, some definitional issues just to, to flag before we get too deeply into it. So there's a lot of perils and pitfalls in how we demarcate groups of um, humans or non-humans, right? Um, there's always some value assumption embedded in the way we refer to groups of humans, especially those who are marginalized. So, you know, within the disabilities rights community, for a long time, the idea was we should refer to people with disabilities as persons with disabilities, right? We, the idea being, we don't want to identify um, a person with that trait, right? To sort of essentialize or identify with them with their disability, that's too limiting. We wanna show respect to all human beings and not identify them as disabled people, right? Or handicapped people. Having said that, you know, I think you would find some in that community now who are, you know, not sure that's necessarily the way to go. Um, many these days, not all people in the disabilities rights community, but many would say that disabilities are something that is core and essential to the identity of, of people in that group, and maybe even something to celebrate. And so we shouldn't detach the trait disability from the person. I just want to flag that, you know, like to, to let us know that there's, um, there's, there's a lot of um, issue in just even how we refer to such marginalized groups. And for the most part in this talk, I'll, I'll use the phrase cognitively disabled humans. The same thing applies for sure to how we talk about our uh, non-human animal cousins on the, on the planet, right? It's a curious fact that for the longest time, human beings like to divide themselves into tidy 
metaphysical categories. There's humans on the one side and everything else, all the non-human animals, which we just call animals, right? But you know, anyone with a bit of biology knows that um, we share a lot of DNA with our chimpanzee cousins, we're animals. And so it is peculiar that we have these categories, these conceptual frameworks that dice in a dualistic way, um, the animal, the, the kingdom of beings into animals and non-human animals. For the most part, I'm gonna use the phrase animals here just for simplicity's sake, but I, I do want to you know, flag this as, as a kind of interesting fact. And, and we'll turn to this right now in, in the first part of our talk, the kind of assumptions that, uh, especially in Western philosophy, divide up the human and the non-human in a kind of rigid way. So this, this is interesting, a human-animal divide. Um, if you go back to the beginning of Western philosophy or the early stages of it, you have you know, philosophers very concerned to separate human beings from the rest of creation. So you look at Aristotle and his ethics. He says, you know, we're, we're somewhere between beasts and gods. Um, we're somewhere in the middle there, but it's pretty clear Aristotle wants to say what is special about us, what defines our essence, what makes us valuable is the part closer to the gods. It is not what we share with non-human creatures. And a deep assumption here is that that part of us, which we share with something higher with the gods maybe, is, is our rational faculty, our rational mind. And Aristotle's very clear that that part of us is higher than and rules over the body. It's kind of like, you know, um, the boss, right? The body is ruled by the rational mind. And in fact, um, we're expressing our nature more truly when, when reason governs that appetitive part of our soul. Aristotle's very clear about that, you know, so we all have desires and instincts. We want to stay in bed a little bit longer on a morning. Um, we want to um, indulge in some Baskin Robbins ice cream, but the rational mind governs those appetites and directs us towards more productive, virtuous behavior. It rules the body, so to speak. And, you know, Aristotle is very clear that just as your rational mind rules your particular body, uh, it's fitting that we rational beings rule those creatures who are simply bodily beings beings governed by feelings and instincts, the animals, right? So Aristotle is, is very clear about that. And um, I'll give you a little passage here from his politics where he makes this point in no uncertain terms. So here's a quote from um, Aristotle. Where then there is such a difference is that between the soul and body or between men and animals, the lower sort are by nature slaves and it is better for them as for all inferiors that they should be under the rule of a master. Okay, so here you get Aristotle. And if you look at surrounding passages and other things he says, you get Aristotle very clear that, you know, human beings are entitled to rule animals as slaves. But as, as uh, you might guess, he also draws the conclusion that the same thing is true of certain kinds of human beings who are not fully rational. And you probably could guess who he would pick out there. He talks about women, he talks about children, certain kinds of slaves. These types of humans are kind of governed by their appetites, right? You think of the stereotypes here, they're, they're not in control of their bodies. And so certain other types of humans who share in reason to a greater degree are you know, absolutely entitled to rule over them, maybe even treat them as slaves. And you, you get that in Aristotle. And, and this is sort of a deep, deep assumption in the, uh, in the tradition. So, you know, um, I say this as a deep assumption in the Western tradition, the sharp divide between humans and animals. But, you know, there are many on the call today that study indigenous thought. And certainly the same kinds of assumptions don't show up in, in indigenous thinking, right? There's not that kind of rigid divide between the humans and the rest of creation. And, I certainly am nowhere near as qualified to speak to that as, as maybe a few of, of the people um, here on, on, on our talk today. And you also see this in, in 
Asian traditions, such as Hinduism and Buddhism, for example, where there's a much more um, fluid kind of account of the relationships between different kinds of beings. So there's all kinds of transmigration between the human and the animal in those religious and philosophical traditions, um, and uh, indeed the human, the animal, gods, all, all sorts of realms of being. I just flag that um, to help us see that this is a very much a kind of Western kind of assumption. And of course, there are then resonances with this Western philosophical assumption of a sharp divide between the humans and animals. And what you get in some strands of the Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, especially the kind of image of God thesis in the Judeo-Christian tradition that human beings are created in the image of God and, and therefore entitled to uh, rule over the rest of nature. So it's that, you know, no surprise, right, um, given how deeply um, sort of embedded this conceptual framework is that you have unfortunate, um, you know, dehumanization tactics made throughout history um, where a group where, you know, sort of a, a, a one, one in-group attempts to marginalize an out-group or a, a subordinate group by comparing the out-group to animals. The tactic there is to, you know, all, well, there's all kinds of tactics here, psychological distancing, pseudo justifications to treat um, the marginalized groups in any way that um, the dominant group sees fit, right? So you can think of your, you know, your examples, whether it be blacks, Jews, women, there are abundant examples of certain stereotypical animals associated with these groups. Um, and the whole purpose is a kind of moral denigration what you know can only be called dehumanization, and um, that is a familiar tactic. And I would call this like an immoral purpose of the comparison between certain kinds of humans and animals. But you know, you see this. Um, I, I, I wouldn't say Aristotle, you know, and, and philosophers caused this, but they're giving expression to this kind of conceptual framework, and um, and giving some kind of authoritative justification to it. Now, obviously, the same thing is particularly um, true of cognitively disabled people. And, uh, you know, uh, cognitively disabled people it, it picks out a great um, variety of kinds of people, right? So I do want to indicate that we're talking, you know, any number of kinds of conditions from, you know, brain injuries to mild or severe autism. So, you know, that, that category is itself very disparate. But nevertheless, as one theorist of disabilities puts it, dis cognitively disabled people have often been regarded as having the face of the beast, um, institutionalized, marginalized, treated in all kinds of ways, either thought of as subhuman or indeed not human at all. And so it's with that kind of context that, you know, I think a lot of disabilities advocates are operating in. So they, they cognitively disabled people bear a special danger here. And you know, no surprise, right? They lack the share of what is often thought of as being the defining trait of humanity, rationality, or some kind of rational capacity. Now, at this point, you might want to say, look, uh, we want to include all human beings in a kind of universal um, scheme of, of universal equal human rights. So let's draw the moral line around the entire human race. It's being a human that morally matters, okay, um, that gives you equal moral status. But philosophers uh, have pointed out that it's kind of hard to get clear on what is it about being a member of the human race that confers special moral status, right? Um, is it genetic humanity? Uh, if so, what's so special or significant about that? Why does genetic code have moral significance? Why do we draw the line around something like a species human being? Um, consider the possibility of aliens, uh, Ferengis, Vulcans, Romulans, uh, pick your favorite alien, maybe even you know, um, artificial beings uh, that have developed intelligence and other kinds of capacities um, where for all intents and purposes, you say they're, they're people, right? Um, if you met such beings, right, um, who cared about their loved ones, who had, you know, moral codes, I doubt you would say that they don't have moral status because they don't happen to be a human, in, at least in some sort of genetic sense. So what does that mean? Well, it's very uh, tempting and attractive. Philosophers keep going back to this 
to sort of think it's not your species that confers moral status. It's something about your psychological characteristics or properties, right? It's something about those properties, those functional characteristics independently of, of your species. Um, you know, it's species maybe isn't the point, it's these psychological qualities. And yeah, maybe um, they tend to be um, associated with certain types of animal species, but there's no necessary connection there, right? There's a contingent connection between that. Um, so there's a little picture for Battlestar Galactica fans um, of some Cylons. And um, so they, you know, for all intents and purposes seem like fellow human beings. And if you watch that series, there's all sorts of surprises about who was a Cylon all along. Okay, well, there we are. So kind of rounding into the last part of the, the first section here of, of my talk, I wanna now like turn to the animal rights philosophers or animal advocates who have made a comparison to cognitively disabled humans for what they regard as a moral purpose, not to dehumanize, not to denigrate, but rather to show us that we should be treating animals better than we have been. And um, that's what I'll do right now. So I wanna start actually by going back to the late 1700s and just looking over a quote here from British philosopher, Jeremy Bentham, okay? So Jeremy Bentham's an interesting guy. He is one of the founders of this school of um, thinking called utilitarianism and a hugely influential philosophy. But Bentham makes this kind of comparison between human beings and animals to, to show that maybe animals should matter more. So if you'll bear with me, I think I'm gonna just read this quote. Um, Bentham writes, uh, the day may come when the rest of animal creation may acquire those rights which never could have been withholden from them, but by the hand of tyranny. The French have already discovered that the blackness of the skin is no reason why a human being should be abandoned without redress to the caprice of a tormentor. It may one day come to be recognized that the number of legs, the velocity of the skin, or the termination of the os sacrum are reasons equally insufficient for abandoning a sensitive being to the same fate. What else is it that should trace the insuperable line? Is it the faculty of reason or perhaps the faculty of discourse? But a full grown horse or dog is beyond comparison, a more rational as well as a more conversable animal than an infant of a day or a week or even a month old. Suppose they were otherwise, what would it avail? The question is not, can they reason? nor can they talk, but can they suffer? So Bentham in a very direct way offers this argument, which uh, later kind of becomes known by some as the argument from marginal cases, an argument that compares what you might say are, I don't wanna call children marginal humans, but they're not fully developed humans, right? And tries to say that, you know, the, you have plenty of examples of, from the animal kingdom of more psychologically developed, more autonomously directed, more communicative beings than children. We treat children with the utmost respect and regard, but we do so many um, awful things to animals. We, uh, you know, we slaughter them for food in painful conditions. We experiment on them. We use them for entertainment, so on and so on. So Bentham compares in this quote, non-human animals to infants. Later, and we'll see in a second, philosophers compare the non-human animals to cognitively disabled people, but he's making that point. The other thing that he's saying in this quote, which is controversial, and I, I, I assume this could be a matter of debate, he's comparing the quest for equal rights of blacks to you know, what we might wanna say is the quest for some kind of equality for animals, and kind of saying just as, you know, your racial type, whatever that means, your skin color is not a reason for being subjected to slavery. So too should the type of hide you have or the type of tail you do or don't have. And so he's putting um, that kind of comparison into play as well. So, you know, Bentham is operating out of this tradition the, uh, that is utilitarianism. Notice that this tradition is not like privileging rationality it's saying that it's simply the capacity to experience pleasure and pain that confers moral status. 
it's a psychological um, condition, right? But it's not rationality that matters. The line is pleasure and pain. And the slogan for utilitarianism is maximize the most happiness for the most beings. I'm being very um, simplistic here. There are a lot of versions of utilitarianism and um, a lot of variants of it. It's still very dominant today. And you have philosophers today, uh, Peter Singer, Australian philosopher being one of them, who doggedly apply this philosophy to all kinds of practical issues, including world hunger, war, animal ethics, and other matters. Um, and, and my colleague, Peter Seipel, who I think is on the call today, does some work engaging those philosophers on the issue, uh, engaging Singer and others on the issue of um, our obligations to um, those in great need, our obligations to be altruistic um, to a much greater degree than most of us affluent folks are. So I'm not gonna say too much about utilitarianism. What I wanna do is just more plainly paint the picture here of what I'll call the argument from marginal cases. And Bentham is already giving that argument. Um, let's just kind of look at its basic structure. Th this, this type of argument basically says, hey, uh, whatever moral system you hold, impartiality is usually at the center of it. You know, whether you're a utilitarian or what's called a Kantian, Kant's moral philosophy, or some other you know, philosophical or moral system, most accept that we should treat similar cases in similar ways. Impartiality demands a kind of consistency. Treat similar cases in similar ways. If X and Y are relevantly similar, then we ought to treat them in, in very similar ways. And some animals, in fact, have greater capacities, cognitive capacities than some humans. And it's plain darned arbitrary to favor those comparable interests of humans over animals. This is the you know, kind of core of, uh, of the ideas behind the argument from marginal cases. And it's certainly something that Bentham had already been driving at in the late 1700s. Um, the argument from marginal cases, by the way, need not be wedded to Bentham's utilitarianism. Some philosophers would deploy it um, you know, with other kinds, you, you might say like, treat similarly rational beings in similar ways. And then you might, after studying biology, note that there are plenty of primates who have a great, you know, great degree of developed cognitive capacities. Um, you know, in the case of some chimpanzees in, in captivity have even been taught sign language. And so, you know, they deserve serious moral status. You, you get people like Jane Goodall, for example, arguing that um, essentially primates are people uh, at least, uh, you know, the primate cousins of ours, and they should be given almost like un universal rights like anybody else. So this argument for marginal cases is pressed, as you saw, even in the Bentham quote, into, you know, the, um, into developing a concept um, uh, that is meant to parallel what we have developed with respect to our um, moral and political judgments about racism and sexism. And that is the concept of speciesism, right? Um, Peter Singer in his famous book, Animal Liberation, characterizes it as a prejudice or attitude of bias towards the interests of members of one's own species and against those of others. So Singer's very clear that just like the racist giving greater weight to the members of their own race or the sexist giving you know, greater weight to males over females, so too does the speciesist privilege human beings over non-human animals. Um, and it, it's a moment in um, time where, you know, a philosopher, usually we don't really make much of an impact. I, I, I'm sorry to say, I mean, philosophers sometimes do, but in Singer's case, I think it's fair to say that his book, Animal Liberation and these kinds of concepts really put um, animal ethics or animal rights on a kind of social justice footing akin to you know, the quest for racial or gender equality. And not just as what you might say, like a, a, a sentimental approach to our concern for animals. Like, you know, um, we, we need to be more compassionate or loving. Um, it's rather you know, a matter of moral principle and a matter of consistency, whether you love animals or not, that you avoid this kind of speciesism. Very you know, controversial, I'd be curious to hear in the discussion 
um, about, you know, there's legitimate debate here. Like, do we really want to say that even if we agree there's something like um, speciesist behaviors and attitudes, are there not important differences between how racism functions and how it works in a social structure and how speciesism functions? Aren't there real differences with the way that the um, subordinate groups um, receive these biases and, and so on. So we might talk about that afterwards. All right, so what, what do we got here? Well, look, um, we've got psychological properties accounts, right? That are basically um, going to say something like psychological development, whatever you know that means comes in levels, okay? And then it becomes very tempting and hard to resist the assumption that the more of that you have, the more you have moral status or the more moral status you have. It's kind of like there's a correlation between your psychological development and your value. So you might pick on like rationality or cognitive and say that levels, right? That levels up or down. The more rational, the more, co more cognitive capacities, the more valuable you are. And some philosophers like Jeff McMahon, who I'll talk about in a second, seem to go in that direction. Even within that utilitarian tradition, which does seem to be more open than um, the Western tradition that privileges rationality, you have ways that utilitarians could even say, you know, some beings are of higher value or have a superior life than others based on their cognitive development. So real quick, like John Stuart Mill says things like, you know what, not all pleasures are equal. The pleasures of working through a complex math problem, <clears throat> the pleasures of uh, listening to a Jerry Garcia guitar solo, uh, the pleasures of learning how to play classical gar uh, violin are higher than the pleasures of having, you know, a six pack of beer or indulging in, you know, some pizza. And he, he sort of says that that means that those who have those higher cognitive capacities enjoy some kind of superior sort of experiences. So even in that utilitarian tradition, you get a, a leveling kind of idea. And then other utilitarians who talk less about pleasure and more about desires um, are going to say things like, you know, those of us who have sort of self-consciousness, who have a concept of self, have special higher level desires that, um, that maybe uh, privilege our lives and make it worse for us to be killed than beings who don't, right? So those of us on the call today have these higher level desires, even just like surviving long enough to accomplish some pr project um, or seeing our children graduate from college. We have these higher level desires that kind of stem from, you know, our self-consciousness, our possession of abstract concepts and a, a cow in the field or a pig um, arguably don't, don't care about their lives or desire that their lives go a certain way. Um, maybe they just desire to you know, satisfy various kinds of needs on the more biological level. So <clears throat> this then leads to um, Jeff McMahon, who kind of just doubles down and says this. Um, basically, McMahon taking this kind of leveling assumption says this. You know what, people? Um, the treatment of animals is probably governed by way stronger constraints than we've traditionally supposed. So uh, McMahon wants to say, if you take these kinds of uh, argument from marginal cases seriously and a leveling assumption about you know, greater cognitive capacity, meaning greater worth, we probably need to elevate the way we treat animals. But controversially, McMahon says, it might also mean that cognitively impaired people have been given more respect than they are uh, than they are due. Um, so we might need to level up the non-human animals and level down cognitively disabled people. And this this is a, a point McMahon makes. Um, I actually, I, I know Jeff McMahon, he was a, a, a professor at Illinois when I was in graduate school there. I never had a class with him. He always seemed to be off on some research grant and always writing um, in some office. But I had I have talked with him from time to time. I, I kind of wish I had engaged him in class, but he's, one of those professors that you know seem to teach rarely because they were always writing. All right, so take a deep breath. I hope I'm not going too fast here. We're ready for part two. Um, the argument uh, response from disabilities advocates. So as you might imagine, um, this argument has has rattled um, and and upset 
those people who advocate for persons with disabilities or cognitively disabled people. Um, Eva Kate is a philosopher who's done a lot of important work on disabilities, and she herself is a mother of an adult child who she, can, she cares for who has a cognitive disability. And so this is how she kind of puts it. And she kind of you know, doubles down here. And, and even in like academic conference settings, there, there were some clashes between her and others and, and Jeff McMahon and Peter Singer. So they're definitely you know, like responding with some um, strong negative um, response to this animal ethics comparison. So here's what Kate says. For a mother of a severely cognitively impaired child, the impact of such an argument, and she's talking about the argument for marginal cases there, is devastating. How can I begin to tell you what it feels like to read texts in which one's child is compared in all seriousness and with philosophical authority to a dog, pig, rat, and most flatteringly, a chimp? How corrosive these comparisons are, how they mock those relationships that affirm who we are and why we care. Okay, so this is philosophers who tend to be, you know, I don't know, all of us academics tend to be a little bit maybe cerebral, sometimes overly intellectualistic, detached from feelings. I, I don't want to draw a stereotype, but certainly philosophers can get into that kind of logical mode. And, you know, that's sometimes a good thing. I often, you know, tell my students that in the thick of all these moral issues that we feel so passionately about, philosophy is valuable in helping us step back and um, consider things in a more logical and cool way. But but, you know, maybe that's not always such a good thing. So McMahon apparently, you know, at a conference offers an apology for hurting her feelings and Kitte replies, you know, look, McMahon, um, my, your apology shouldn't be about my feelings. That misfires. It's not for my sake that I wanted the mother-child relationship acknowledged. It was for my daughter's sake. What our morally significant relationship in my caring work reveals is that whatever is due to the child of another mother is due to my child, regardless of any of her particular features or morally significant psychological properties. Okay, it's kind of what she says. So, you know, Kite there, I think, is getting at something. She's, first of all, you know, calling him to task that don't think this is about my feelings. It's about like a certain way of thinking about ethics and the cognitively disabled um, people. And I think if you look at other work by Kitsay, and there's a picture there of her and her um, daughter, she's trying to say there's something wrongheaded about the way that animal ethics philosophers on this issue and other issues get really hung up on an individual psychological properties. And it's important to shift and think more about caring relations and think of moral life more as a network of embedded um, caring relationships. And so often she, she puts it like this with a kind of slogan that, um, you know, a cognitively disabled person is some mother's child. And, you know, her point there is not to just emphasize the caregiver, but to emphasize the caring relationship and the fact that we're all some mother's child. And something about that moral, um, that, that moral uh, idea she thinks is really missing from those animal ethics philosophers arguments. I'm gonna come back to this. So um, that, that's where we are with this standoff. And what I, what I wanna do pretty briefly here is um, review a few of the arguments that disabilities advocates make against these animal ethicists and kind of go a little bit back and forth, like look at the arguments and then give some possible counter responses and then kind of leave things han hanging on a suspended note. Um, and then we'll get to the point where I, I offer a few tentative mediating um, solutions. Um, so we're, we're, we're more than halfway home, I, I promise you. So here's a few arguments um, that are, are heaved out at um, the animal ethics philosophers by um, disabilities advocates, philosophers. This is from Carlson, um, Rachel Carlson, from a book um, that she wrote in 2010. So she wants to say, you know, what's kind of off base about this argument from marginal cases is it's exploitive, okay? So she's saying something like at a conceptual level, severely intellectually disabled people are being exploited because they're being used in these speciesist arguments, these arguments against speciesism, right? They're being used to make a point against speciesist mistreatment of animals 
but they reap no benefits from this kind of philosophical labor that they're offering, right? So it's almost like cognitively disabled people are being um, enlisted to offer, uh, to do work that they don't benefit from and are exploited in, in that very way, okay? It's an interesting way of thinking of exploitation. And I, don't, I, I wanna unpack this just very briefly, you know, unpack exploitation here very briefly, too, maybe too briefly. Um, you know, whatever else we mean by exploitation, it does seem like we're talking about a relationship between usually a group A and a group B. A is deriving benefits and it's is imposing burdens on the other group. Um, it's not just imposing burdens, but the other group is, is getting no, no obvious benefit. Um, usually we mean something like the, the group that's being exploited has been coerced, right, into this relationship. They haven't consented. Um, and so, you know, to take kind of a classic example, you might say workers under capitalism are exploited because they are forced to sell their labor power to capitalists who extract value from it for profits, right? So kind of classic Marxist uh, analysis. Um, and the idea there is that they're forced, you know, Marx's point is they're forced because capitalism as a system requires there to be labor power sold to another class, right? Like there's no option. Maybe uh, particular laborers can uh, escape out of the, the working class, but there'll always be working class people. And so, you know, Marx suggests that, you know, the worker is creating more value than what they cost to pay in salaries, right? And that value is extracted by a capitalist to, um, to, to make profits. So, um, Maybe one way to think about it is that, I'm sorry, I'll go, going back to that, maybe one way to think about it is that the worker is, a certain part of the day that a worker is employed, they're doing labor um, that they're not paid for, right? Their salaries are paid and they're adding extra benefit to, um, to somebody else. Now, I don't want to get hung up on, you know, whether this is an accurate interpretation of capitalism or whether exploitation is, um, there's more involved, but you know, in response to 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 you know this this argument, this exploitation argument, and given what we're saying about exploitation, we have to note that animal advocates themselves are are working on behalf of others' interests, right? They're not um, arguably in this for some kind of profit, and you might ask yourself, like, if I'm a member of a um, marginalized group would I object that some other group benefits from comparison to, to my group? Um, yeah, so I, I don't know. I mean, you, you, you might still come back to this kind of argument and Carlson Kitte might come back and say, look, cognitively disabled people really don't consent to this, right? At least in many cases where they're, they're not able to give consent. So maybe they still are exploited in some sense. I suspect this isn't the strongest um, objection to the argument from marginal cases, but it's just interesting to me and it brings up some in interesting issues about um, e exploitation that, that might be on the table for um, our discussion. A second objection that I think is a little bit more, um, more, more tough for the animal ethicist to respond to is there's unintentional denigration going on here. Um, so even though these animal advocates may say, hey, I'm just, it's not an immoral purpose that I have. I, I um, am absolutely not concerned with like denigrating cognitively disabled people. The fact is such comparisons will have that effect. Um, this is especially the case given the long history of marginalization and especially the long history of associating people with cognitive disabilities and, and with subhuman animality. And so, um, you know, you might try to respond to, to this by saying, look, um, sure, um, there is this long history of denigration and sure, um, our cultural frameworks often associate animal with something negative or disgusting or lower than the human, but let's reform that cultural framework so that animal no longer has those negative meanings. And that's what an animal ethicist might say in response to that kind of unintentional denigration objection. Um, and I think, you know, that might be true, but like still one must agree, I think that it's, it's risky now, given the conceptual framework we operate under now, which does have, you know, for better or worse, this hierarchical 
framework, which is often used to dehumanize marginalized groups, um, it's still a risky thing to promulgate the argument from marginal cases and make this kind of comparison. So there we are. Okay. I am almost done here. And I, I promise that part three is actually fairly brief compared to the other two parts. So I'm going to be um, wrapping up pretty soon. And then I hope we you know, might have some discussion about these matters. And so this is the mediation part, my just some tentative suggestions about mediation. Um, and I have like two basic things I want to leave us with. One would be, you know, maybe we need to question that levels assumption, right? That idea of levels of this correspond to levels of moral status, levels of psychological development you know, correspond to levels of moral status. Replace that with a different account. And then I also, I think more promising for our talk today, want to suggest that we think of what Kite is up to and the what the animal ethicists are up to as something more like provisional provocative strategies to prompt us to overcome moral blindness. Uh, I know that's a mouthful, but I, I wanna maybe see if this works. Like, let's think of these as not exclusive clashes, but provisional strategies remedying specific kinds of moral blindness. All right, how about the levels assumption? I, I do think that the concerns about this argument from marginal cases, you know, arise from um, arise from the claim that comparison entails shifts in overall moral status. So a shift down for the cognitively disabled, a shift up for non-human animals, the kind of thing McMahon was saying in his quote. So, I mean, easier said than done. I think, you know, we ought to entertain abandoning that kind of leveling assumption and thinking about replacing it with some other approach to the threshold for mattering from a moral point of view or to having moral status. Um, so I would throw that out there. I do think maybe behind the scenes, right, is that McMahon assumption, that assumption that even Singer would make about this kind of leveling up, leveling down. Um, so, you know, here's my, I'm going to really dance over this quickly, but my my own approach, which I'm, I'm working out in some of the things I'm working on, is to kind of say that um, sentience, utilitarians are sort of on the right track, that sentience marks some kind of important threshold. And um, I don't want to go the utilitarian route, but like it is a significant threshold. And it might be a place where we sort of say something like, let's take this as a starting point. Um, that all of us who are moral agents, right? And that's a vast smaller group of animals than everybody out there who isn't a moral agent, who can't reason with from moral principles. All of us have presumptive obligations to conscious subjects, and even when they're not conscious moral agents. And you get this expressed very emphatically in, in a quote from William James. This is from an essay called The Moral Philosopher and the Moral Life take any demand however slight which any creature however weak may make ought it not for its own sake to be satisfied if not prove why not and so you know i think what james is saying is not that look it's not the kind of unreasonable view if there's a demand out there you have an obligation to satisfy it right it's more like if there's a demand out there or a desire of a conscious subject it has a presumption of some kind of importance and I, you know, would would entertain like maybe developing an account that I would call a pluralist view of well-being. And I'm just going to dance over this. Like the core idea would be let's look at individual capacities and not membership in a group or psychological degrees, and and approach a, a being's well well-being, an entity's well-being that way, and think of our obligations in, in those ways. Um, a pluralist account of well-being. Uh, some philosophers call it an individualist account. And I, if, we, if you want, we can talk about that. But I just want to gesture that um, maybe a replacement view would work. What I do want to say, I think, is more to germane to what I want to talk about, conclude today with, is, is something like this. Um, why don't we think of Kite's Some Mother's Child and focus on caring relationships, like that kind of slogan, that kind of approach, and the argument of moral um, argument from marginal cases as strategies for overcoming moral blindness. 
these are strategies that address aspects of our moral life, but hardly the entire terrain. They are provocations that are trying to get at specific limited perspectives of specific moral agents, okay? So it's really important to get concrete here and to always ask whose blindness is at stake and um, from where does that blindness come, come from? Uh, what perspective are we talking about? And I'll say a few things about that here in, in a second. But think of these as strategies meant to address particular kinds of limitations. So to go back to my you know, original assumption, moral philosophy is this ongoing struggle that's continuous with what we're doing in moral life to create a more inclusive ethical republic that, um, that is always in the business of remedying partial perspectives and limited altruism, and that's never done. So think of these provocations as having you know, a double, each one having a double impact. So the slogan, some mother's child is prompting us, you know, who, who are we talking about here? Those of us not in direct relation to disabled persons or cognitively disabled persons to take on the perspective of caregivers or take on this perspective of those caring relationships and to do that kind of perspective shift. It's also prompting us, the non-disabled, to imagine ourselves as possibly vulnerable disabled selves that, that we might become, okay? So, you know, all of us at one point were helpless, cognitively undeveloped little blobs, right? We were all children at one time. And so um, we all, you know, have that kind of vulnerability or dependency and, and too easily forget it and privilege a certain kind of autonomous, you know, sort of outlook. Many of us are, are headed in various degrees of disintegration, decline and so on, and may one day become um, cognitively impaired or disabled in some way, shape or form. And so, you know, Kite's provocation to think of these caring relationships can have this sort of double impact. Um, there's a philosopher by the name of Alistair McIntyre, whose book, um, Dependent Rational Animals, really makes this second bullet point, really, really makes this point well, that he kind of thinks it's a virtue in us, a virtue of humility and of self-acceptance to recognize that fragile vulnerability and not think of us as these like, you know, permanent cognitively self-contained beings. The argument for marginal cases, on the other hand, is prompting us to transfer, transfer the care we might feel for vulnerable humans, maybe cognitively disabled humans or children, to non-human animals, right? To kind of transfer that care um, and to do that perspective shifting. I remember teaching environmental ethics um, and one day, uh, I don't know why I decided this, but showed some footage of a, of a head injury lab at the University of Pennsylvania. It's footage that sort of leaked out of graduate students um, giving baboons head injuries and all kinds of things going wrong, not using proper surgical procedures, mocking the baboons and so on. And, um, you know, and seeing this, this footage was, it was really devastating to watch. And you know, I had to process this with my students. But um, afterwards, you know, sort of seeing the, the baboons in what looked like high chairs waiting for this experiment as a, a father of young children at the time, it was like, wow, like that perspective shift really kicks in. Like these are, you know, these are like children. It also, I think the argument for marginal cases prompts us humans to think of our own animality and, and embodied existence, right? To kind of help to notice like, wow, yeah, we do make this like strange assumption that we don't, that all the bodily parts of us, our physicality, our, our, our animality is something to, you know, to ignore or that we're somehow separate from that, not a, maybe not a healthy attitude to have. So, you know, the, the underlying view of the moral self here is, is one of a self that is relational, that is in relationship to um, others who we have various degrees of affinity with. It's contingent and in process, we're in a process of change um, uh, as moral agents and as, 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 as embodied beings. And we're always situated in some semi-limited perspective. And so a, a responsible moral agency would, one, would be one where we're continuously striving to, to create this inclusive ethical re republic, extending limited sympathy. And also, you know, as, as again, McIntyre's point, uh, acknowledging our vulnerability, our limitation, um, those kinds of virtues, right, are, are an important aspect of integrity, um, one in which 
we acknowledge um, both our limitations, both our, our moral limitations, but also um, our limitations as, as fragile embodied beings. And so I hope that was semi-coherent and um, provoked you to think about things in different ways. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm more trying to open up, st stoke out some uh, thought about our assumptions and encourage dialogue and, and debate. And I wanna thank you for listening. And that's all I have for now. <laughs>